Greetings and welcome back to Old Ways Rising Farm. In today's video, we are going to make buckskin by starting with a piece of raw hide, which looks a whole lot like this. We're going to take it to the spa and we're going to turn it in to nice, fluffy buckskin leather. The stuff is really nice. It is soft. It is fluffy. You know, it's, it's you know, if I just kind of billow it a little bit, it's got a lot of um, drape and softness to it. It's really nice for the next to the skin wear, and it has the unique property amongst leathers that you can make at home of being washable after it is smoked, okay? Now, let's define all of that stuff I just said, <laughs> okay? So, what is buckskin? Um, buckskin as a type of leather is a form of rawhide that has been oiled well enough that the ground substance can no longer glue the protein fibers into a solid hard lump. Okay? What does that mean? Well, ground substance is the mucus which floats in between all of the protein fibers in a living skin. Okay? It's a type of protein that has sugar attached. Because it has sugar attached, it's a really good glue. Because it's sugar and protein-based glue, it shrinks when it dries. So when you have the, you know, the, the skin still in its wet condition, all of these ground substance molecules are stretched out, they attach to multiple protein molecules, and as it dries, they glue, they shrink. And that's why rawhide pulls together into this really stiff, stiff as plywood matrix, okay? We want it to be nice and fluffy because we want to make a shirt or a pair of pants or a pocket or something out of it, right? Um, so we want nice fluffy buckskin. We don't want one of these, okay? Sure, you can make parfleche, but that's one thing. You can make a whole lot more out of a buckskin, okay? Now, how are we going to do this? Well, if you think about, you know, if, you're, if you've ever glued up boards and you didn't want them to stick to your table, or you've made a mold and you didn't want the plaster to stick to whatever you're molding, or you've done any kind of operation like that, what do you do to keep glue from sticking to a surface? You spray it with WD-40, right? You use a release agent. So the process of brain tanning, which isn't really tanning, we'll get there in a second, the process of um, making a buckskin from the rawhide to the fluffy buckskin stage is taking oils, getting them to penetrate into that rawhide and act as a release agent so that the glycoproteins cannot adhere to the protein fibers, okay? Um, the bucking process, which I have shown in previous videos, I will make sure the end screen contains a link to the leather tanning and working playlist, which has all of this stuff in it. The, uh, the bucking process will degrade and harm the glycoproteins. It will not destroy and eliminate the glycoproteins, okay? So they're weakened, but they are there and we still need a release agent. Brain tanning. This is the colloquial term that's used to describe the making of buckskin most often. It's what will be in the title of this video, but I really don't like it. It would be better to call this fat liquor dressing, and I'm going to explain why, because understanding this is actually important. It's not just semantics, right? This is actually important to understand what you're doing to your hide and how to go about it. Because if you understand that, you can troubleshoot, you can know what's going on, you can see what's going on as it's happening, okay? So please bear with me a minute while I explain this. I'm gonna give you the shortest of the short versions now. The longer version with more detail is in a previous video comparing all tanning methods. That's where I break that all down and explain all of this in much more detail with chemical demonstrations and stuff like that, okay? So I would encourage you to go watch that video, but for a synopsis, what we have in, in a hide, in this raw hide, okay, is we have glycoproteins. They have been degraded but not eliminated by the bucking process. So they are here and protein fibers. The protein fibers are the felt that will become the ultimate leather at the end of the day. The glycoproteins are, are mucus molecules with adhesive properties, okay? So they're gonna go out and they're gonna stick to the protein fibers, and then as they dry, they shrink and they pull it together. That's why this stuff is hard as plywood. 
because you have these all of this glue that has reached out, attached to protein fibers, and pulled them together. Okay. Now, tanning is a process where you are taking your leather and you are treating it with chemical agents and achieving the destruction or creation of chemical bonds. So in most true, you know, true tanning processes, you're going to start with um, an acid pickle that's going to completely destroy the glycoproteins and then follow it up with an agent, whether it's plant-based or something inorganic, that will form chemical bonds and link and pull those protein fibers together appropriate for a certain type of leather that you want to make okay we're not doing either of those two things here what we're doing is we're going to say okay glycoproteins you get to stay but you're not allowed to stick to the fibers okay so how do you do that well you add a release agent right if you've ever glued up boards and you don't want them to stick to your workbench what do you do well you can put down wax paper and the wax will prevent sticking you can spray everything up with um, you could use melamine and spray it up with uh, WD-40 or something like that so nothing sticks that's a release agent um, if you've ever made a mold of anything maybe you smeared the you know if you made a plaster mold of something maybe you smeared the something you were molding with Vaseline or with WD-40 again to keep the plaster from sticking to it that's a release agent that's what we're doing so we're taking the rawhide we're leaving it chemically unaltered, but we're going to accomplish the physical change of preventing adhesion between those glycoproteins and the protein fibers. We do that by forcing fats into the matrix. Okay, Literally the same as smearing your mold with Vaseline before you pour your part. Literally the same. <laughs> okay, That's all we're doing. And it really is that simple in concept there's there's art to how you execute it but it is that simple in concept so why brains why historically brains well first it's a waste product that people didn't want to eat right and it's oily so you already have the oils built in and brains is one of two animal tissues that is high in lecithin lecithin is a natural surfactant which allows those oils to interact with water Hide the both the glycoproteins that they want to dissolve in water and the let and the protein fibers want to interact with water Okay, so you can't just ram you can't just take this dip it in pure fat and expect anything to happen It's just gonna sit there You need the water to allow This material to open up and stretch and stretch it does right this and this are approximately the same size high, but you can see how much bigger this one looks because it's all stretched out and fluffy nice, okay? You need the water to go in and help bust up those bonds between the glycoproteins and the protein fibers, initially. And you need the oil to come along with the water. That's why you need a surfactant or a soap-like substance. Lecithin in brain is a naturally occurring soap. Okay. The second material that has that is egg yolk. Egg yolk also a very oily tissue. In order for the animal, the chicken, to produce that oily tissue, it has to have, you know, in a watery yolk, it has to have the lecithin to allow the oils to be managed. Um, same thing, brain and oily tissue, watery matrix, you need the lecithin to allow the oils to be managed. Okay. So those are the two naturally occurring fat liquor solutions mashed up brains and egg yolks but they have drawbacks eggs are expensive especially these days right i don't need to tell any of you that any of you that twice and brain just isn't hard to get I mean, it just isn't easy to get right 500 years ago was a waste product that every farm had today that's not true it's not easy to just go out and get brains at any local grocery store right <coughs> so that's the first problem with it the second is disease transmission prion based diseases like scrapie and chronic wasting disease and mad cow and things like that collect in the brain tissue and can remain in the soil for decades 
so I will not bring anything like that onto my farm. Even though, I mean, the risk of actually having sick brains is so vanishingly small, it's not a, a huge worry, but still, I don't want to take the chance, right? Also, both of those materials will sour and spoil quickly, so you have to work fast. They have a limited amount of time. I mean, yeah, you're not going to spoil it in two days, but it'll, it'll get funky on you, okay? So what I'm going to be using is actual bar soap and vegetable oil. Cheap and readily available. The soap that I'm using, and this is the second half of the bar of soap that I used to tan this hide, and this is what we're doing in this video. Um, this is old-fashioned lye and tallow bar soap. Okay. So this is the, the actual batch that I made on the YouTube channel a, a month or two ago. But if you don't want to make your own, Naps the Bar Soap that people still sometimes use for laundry is basically the same thing. This is when you take fats and you break them down with lye, you get fatty acids like stearic acid, palmitic acid, etc., and glycerin. Right, one unit of glycerin for every three units of fatty acid. Okay, moles if you want to get fancy, but we don't need to get that fancy. Since this can interact with water and it's composed of fatty acids, it can also interact with the fats from which it came. So that's why we can take this and we can grate it up and dissolve it in water and then we can just dump fat into the water and it will all mix together. It won't stratify, it will fully emulsify. And then wherever the water moves, it's going to take the oils with it. And that will get the oils into the hide. Okay? Now, what we're basically making with this is hand cream. So I just brought two back-of-the-hand brand things of hand cream. And if I read the ingredients on this one, um, water, glycerin in the bar soap, um, and alcohol, that's just going to help keep the emulsion stable. Um, stearic acid is the fourth ingredient. Water, glycerin, stearic acid, bar soap and water. And then if I go a little bit further down, we get to lecithin, which is also added to this one. Okay. The second one, back of the hand brand here again, we have water, glycerin, stearic acid, soybean oil. <laughs> Literally, the first four ingredients on this lotion are what we're going to make to soften this hide. This is why I quipped at the beginning that we're taking rawhide to the spa. Okay, We're just going to get it all nice and soft and stretched out. Later, the smoke tanning, the smoking stage, that's the actual tanning. I will explain that in that video, and it's already partially, well, entirely explained in the tanning methods compare video. Okay, So we're going to let that go for now. Um, there is some art to this. There are multiple ways to do this. When I was setting up this video series, I wanted to, you know, like I sorted through a bunch of methods, experimented with stuff, and what I'm presenting here is what I think is the lowest barrier to entry, most approachable way to go about making some of your own buckskin. Okay? So if you would like to learn how to do this, keep watching and we'll dig into the project. So what we're going to be doing today is to start to take this hide. This is a normal sized deer hide, a little bit on the thin side, so it's a very nice for garment type work. And we are going to start the fat liquoring process. So, the solution that we're gonna make for our fat liquor is going to be approximately equal parts soap, and for soap you can use any bar soap that is a real lard or tallow and lye soap, right? So, um, this bar is from the batch that I made on the channel not too long ago. If you want to go reference that soap making video, you can make your own. And you can still get these. There's a number of different brand names that will make these. Usually they're selling them as, as laundry soaps. Okay. But you want a real soap. You don't want a modern non-soap detergent. <laughs> okay. You want actual soap for this. And we're going to take our bar of soap and we're just going to grate it up on this here cheese grater. Okay. 
and in true cooking show fashion, I've already mostly done this. So, we'll just finish off our measure. And I'm just using a half cup. It doesn't matter exactly what measure you use. For a deer hide, I found a half cup works pretty well. You can, if you have a bigger hide, use more. If you have a smaller hide, use less. And then I have a half cup of water. And this is just tap water warm. And I'm gonna put the soap in here. And we want to get this as loose and dissolved as possible. We're basically just trying to make liquid soap. Okay. You kind of mush her up. This is why you want to grate it nice and fine to facilitate this process. Mush it up with your hands, get it nice and loose. So we're making our liquid soap. The purpose of this is to emulsify our oils. We have the water and the soap. Beloved, I need a hand. Here. If you could take the lid off that, mm -hmm. give me another half a cup of this. Helps to have an assistant when you've got really messy hands. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Full half cup, more. Okay, thank you, beloved. And now this is doing a very nice job. This is doing a very nice job of emulsifying that oil, right? So this is equal parts soap, oil, and water. Okay. And also when you put the oil in, if there's a couple of last globs of soap, it will help it dissolve too, because the soap can act, interact with both equally well. Okay. So we've got about a cup and a half of this mixture. What we've really basically made is a type of hand cream. Okay? Stuff is going to really moisturize your hands. Even though you think like I'm sticking my hands in pure soap, it's going to dry me out. It actually is a moisturizer. Okay? Which is kind of neat. It's supposed to. It is. That's the whole point. We're going to moisturize our hide. Turns out things that moisturize hide, moisturize hide. Mm. Interesting. Now, let me just increase my mess and push all this stuff away. So, now what we're going to do here is we're going to take this, we're going to massage it into the surface of our crinkly rawhide. And it's going to take some time to penetrate. This is a little bit of a messy process, but it's just so clean up. You're not going to ruin anything by doing this. Okay. It's going to be a little tricky to get it on every surface because it's so wrinkly up. But you can get it most bit of a tear in the hide there from the graining process ripped a little bit. Not ideal, but it's out at the edge, so we can work around that when we cut pieces from it to make products. Smear it all up. Thank you. Thank you, beloved. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you can see we've got that side all smeared. Is that in the frame? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Now, this is going to start to allow the hide to relax and loosen. It's going to take some time. I usually like to do this step in the evening around dinner time. 
and then the hide is nice and relaxed and ready to proceed with by breakfast the following day. Okay. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep smearing this. Get it all on. And then I'm going to put it in a trash bag. Now let it sit for a couple hours. And then I'll get it out and massage it. And then I'll let it sit for a couple more hours. And I'll get it out and massage it. By that time I'll be able to have it loose enough that I can roll it up into a little ball in said trash bag and leave it overnight. Okay. So I'm going to keep doing this and doing that. Then tomorrow morning we will rejoin and I'll show you what it looks like. So it is first thing the next morning and you can see I've rolled this hide up into a nice neat little package here in this bag and just left it sit overnight with that um, soap and oil solution. Now, I did have to make a little bit more. I rolled it up the first time and it just soaked up every last little bit of what I had put on it. So I made another batch and when I made the, the second batch I smeared it on the other side. Mm -hmm. And that got me enough flexibility that I could roll it up. So you can see we're starting to <clears throat> get it to really relax, but it's still not absorbing water really well. Okay. This is where we're going to have to start working it. But there's sort of a balance here. If it's too dry, you can't really pull the fibers free from what remains of those glycoproteins, right? They have been degraded and wounded by the uh, liming process, but not removed by the liming process, okay? So, it's, if it's too dry, you can't stretch the fibers out because the glycoproteins are still grabbing it on. But, you can't stretch it out until it gets to a certain moisture content, mm. right? So this is going to be getting this fully rehydrated and stretched out is a process of soaking and stretching and then soaking again and then stretching again and then soaking again and then stretching again. So we're going to start with the first soaking by taking a little bit of water from this watering can and we're just going to start to get this pressed down in the bucket and rinse some of the glop off of it. Okay. We have a chicken friend coming to visit here this morning. His name is Sam. His name is Sam. He is 100% a good boy. Okay. There, that should be enough water. We want to make sure that we have plenty of this soap and oil mix. We don't want an excess of water. <clears throat> but we do want enough water in here that we can really get the hide down in to get to start getting it fully saturated with the water. Okay. Kind of work it with our hands a little bit get this soap worked in, get it worked out. And now areas like this, right, that's still completely hard. This, if I stretch it, can you see how it starts to go white and really relax? Mm -hmm. okay. That's what we're going for, right, right there. That's what we want. Now that is soft <laughs> and supple and stretched. And because the, uh, the water in the soap solution is all that's available to soak in. We're getting very good penetration of this fat liquor mixture on the first pass. Okay. But this is still 
too hard and crunchy to be able to soak up. So that's what we're doing right now. Kind of massage this around, get it into the nooks and crannies that were too wrinkled up to do before. Stretch out where I can, right? Like here, this section just went right soft, right quickly again. These are the belly sections where it's going to be more relaxed anyway. Okay. So where I can get a stretch, I'll get a stretch. Where I can't, it'll soak in the water for another for an hour or so. Okay. Here where that was all folded up and I couldn't get all of it in, it's relaxed enough. I can pull those folds out. Okay, so brute force there. This little bit of leg skin, which may or may not be finishable. Sometimes you can get these, sometimes they're real recalcitrant. Massaging it in and pulling it out and massaging it in. This is that first stretching softening step. Okay, now that's ready to cooperate. I will work on the other end here. This, this neck is another section that tends to be a problem spot. See, none of that is ready to stretch out. That's the thickest section on the deer. This work back in. We don't want to leave those globs. The hide will absorb the water out. You'll kind of have a glob of the soap oil. We want to get those back in the water so they can distribute evenly. But you can see we're starting starting to stretch. This probably won't be workable. That'll probably get cut off. I will make that decision a little later. Okay. Another nice spot that's stretched right out. Mm -hmm. okay. Get it while I can. If it's working, keep working it. Okay. There. So, we made a little bit of progress stretching, a lot of progress getting the soap globs pulled apart. And now, this is just gonna go, just gonna smoosh it down in the bucket. Okay. <clears throat> I'm gonna let it sit there to rehydrate while I eat breakfast and make a tool. Okay, so it has been about an hour or so. Kitty, that's good. Tastes like soap. You don't want that. Anyway, it's been about an hour or so since I took the hide, watered it down, and put it in the bucket of water. In that time, we have eaten breakfast, fed the animals, and made a stick. <laughs> okay? So this is really the only tool that you need for this process. This is just a hunk of maple that I cut while fixing some fence yesterday and I went and just Boy Scout hatchet whittle the point on it, right? So if you've got some young'uns, give them this job, they'll, they'll think they've, you know, they'll think they're in heaven. They get to whittle a stick and get a compliment for it, right? So what we have is a fairly long taper but it doesn't taper all the way to the point at that. The point kind of comes in at more of like a, a bit of a 45. Because we're going to put quite a bit of rough pressure on this. So you don't want this to be a real fine knife edge. But you do want it to come to, you, you do want it to be, come to a point, okay? But fairly, you know, fair, fairly steep angle there. Not a, not a real fine angle. Now, this is our breaking stake. So what we have to do is we have to take the hide and nothing here is toxic or nasty. This stuff will not sour the way that actual brains or eggs will. It will not hurt your hands. In fact, it will moisturize them quite nicely. It will not hurt your plants. It will not damage anything. Okay. 
Uh, if you have a lot of oil, yeah, maybe you could get an oil stain in your clothes. Don't wear your Sunday finest. But other than that, this is very, very innocuous. But you can start to see it's, it's getting fairly limp, right? It's, it's starting to look and work more like a fabric. Okay? And that's what we want to foster. Kind of stretch it out as much as I can with my hands to see what I'm working with. You see, it's starting to have that stretch to it. Okay. Now, some places it has already come all the way nice. Where it is all the way stretched out and loose, like this, it's going to start to feel really, really soft. Really, really soft, almost almost a little slimy at this stage. It'll feel a little bit stodgy because there's so much oil in this water. Okay. But right next to this, right in there, you can see it's not really absorbing the water. This is where our stake comes in. So I'm going to put it over the stake and then just pull down. Okay. And where I do this. work in both directions back and forth okay can you see it's starting to take on that white coloration now let me do a little section here it's not going to get as soft as the section that worked pretty much loose when I was first stretching this out. Okay. The reason is because it hasn't been able to absorb the water yet. When you see little pockets like right here, see most of this is worked loose. There's a little pocket here that's still, this in frame beloved? Mm -hmm. Yeah. A little pocket here that's still stiff and there's a pocket here that's still stiff. So that's what I'm trying, those pockets are what I'm trying to work out on the stake right now. Okay. You want to work it all the way out to all of the tips. Change directions, just get on it however you need to. Once you start getting it loose, you just kind of work it back and forth like that. It'll work really loose. And then what's really important is that you get out to the edges, right? So you're going to have a little bit of stiffness in the edges. That's inevitable. You're not going to solve all of it. But we still want to get as much as we can. So when I come to an edge like this, I am going to take the time, kind of hold it with my thumb and let my thumb slide up while I'm pulling down with my other hand. So I'm holding it tight with my thumb, and then pulling it over the stake. Okay? Now, next thing I'm going to say about this. You won't get it all perfect on the first pass. Right? There's going to be patches where it's going to be, it's, it's going to resist. Okay? But notice, you, you can see how floppy this is a good section to show. You can see how floppy all this is. This was relaxed when I was stretching it by hand in the, the previous clip, and then it fully absorbed the liquid. This is just relaxed now, and you can see it's a whole lot stiffer. When I put this back in the bucket, this section that's been stretched out is going to now absorb the liquid, and it will come out as floppy as this. And any sections let in here will be helped in absorbing water by what's adjacent to them. So these sections that I have worked the stake over but have not stretched out is because they're still too dry. So skip them, move down to the next section, work the next section as best as you can. Okay. Don't, you know, don't just sit and fight with one of those little tough spots. It's not going to go. If it doesn't go in, in one or two passes over the end of your breaking stake, it's not going to go until you re-soak it. OK? 
okay? So I'm gonna work over this one full pass and then I'll show you what it looks like before we put it in the bucket. So here's the uh, progress that we made for the first round of working it over the steak. You can see how much of it is now this nice white color. How much of it is this nice white color, okay? Um, you can also see it's splotchy. That's fine. That's, this is the first round of working, not the only round of working. Um, you'll also see, hopefully, I'm not sure how well the camera's going to pick it up, but some of the areas here where I have material that was worked previously that fully absorbed the solution and areas that were just worked that have not fully absorbed the solution, you can kind of see the difference in them. Now, areas like this, it's relatively thin leather, but it was starting to dry out on me, so I lost the ability to keep stretching it. So that'll work out in the next pass. And areas like the neck, where it's really, really thick, and it didn't absorb it all enough to be able to stretch it. But again, even just working back and forth and chopping up that really thick, resistant to absorbing moisture material, just working back and forth across it will make that whole neck absorb better and it will all be a whole lot nicer in the next round. Okay, So we're starting to transition from a block of rawhide and you know solidified protein and the glycoprotein glues to an open protein felt and that's the whole point of this fat liquoring process. So this goes back in the bucket for another hour or so and I'll show you the next pass. Okay we're Oh, maybe 45 minutes or so. This would have been ready a little bit earlier, but we had some other things we were working on. It didn't quite get back to it right as soon as we possibly could have. That's okay. Um, it's doing a good job of soaking up the water, but I just wanted to show you how much water I have in here, right? It's just enough to cover the hide. You don't have to be super obsessive with quantities on this, right? you're going to make enough of the initial gloop to cover both surfaces. If it sucks it all up and wants more, make a little bit more. If you have a little extra, meh, you have a little extra. And then when you put it in the bucket, you're just um, putting enough water on top to try, you know, just to get it covered, just so that you can submerge it, right? The smallest amount of water possible to get the hide fully in and submerged, okay? Um, so, you know, don't be too worried about needing exactly this or exactly that measurement. Just kind of let the size of the hide tell you what you need to do. Now, if you look at this, you see how just, you know, soft and drapey and supple this has become. Okay, that's what we want. Um, there are still, of course, these areas that we didn't get to. But let me... Let me pull this all the way out here. Try to squeeze as much of that liquid back in. If you're doing multiple hides, I would recommend using a batch for each. I did do one one time where I tried to reuse some of this stuff and I didn't have enough oil in it to really truly oil the second hide. So anyway, that's an aside. You can see that there you know, still are patches here that are translucent. It should be fully opaque when it's ready. Okay. Um, so these translucent patches, like right there where my finger is, are areas that I didn't get stretched out last time. but because they are adjacent to areas that I did get stretched out, they are um, more absorbent. They're getting they're getting the moisture absorbing in from the sides as well as just the surfaces. They did stretch a little bit, so these will be easy to work over in this round. Okay, and those areas that I had just gotten last time, you can see they're they're now just as supple and soft as the areas that were at the edges that I got the first time, okay? So now, this is just a function of literally rinse and repeat, <laughs> okay? 
So I'm going to take my stick. We're going to hold the stick between, with the feet, and we are going to continue working this hot. Okay? So I'm going to work at this, and we'll join back when there's something else to show. So at this point, I have worked over the whole hide at least once. You can see it's got a nice, loose, relaxed texture to it, and I'm just chasing little spots, okay? This spot, you know, right right here on the top of the back, that's thicker leather. It dried out a little quicker because I was working the other end, right? <coughs> so you just keep chasing. By this point, the question is going to come up, well, how do you know when you're done, when it's time to quit this stage and move on to the next? And that is just a function of feel. So after we've done this and we, we've stretched and soaked and stretched and soaked a couple times, you will be able to take the sections and you'll know what's all the way done. It, it will make sense. I can't exactly tell you because it's a very tactile thing. But, you know, I can come to these sections and know that this region is all the way done because of how it feels. It has been moving in a softer and softer and more and more supple and loose and relaxed condition the whole time I've been working, and it's no longer changing. You'll know what that feels like when you actually get your hands on it and do it. Now, I can feel that this spot is different. I can see it's different and I can feel it's different. So, again, more of the same. Ah, clumsy, okay, more of the same. We get it, and that section that feels different, I just give a quick and very deliberate, very pointed going over with the stick, okay? So now I'm going, and I'm not just working large areas trying to get the majority of it finished. I am going and working individual sections. Just okay? spot checking. Spot checking. I'm also going all the way around the edge and very deliberately coming to the kind of the corners of the stake and working right over the tough spots right at the edge. You're always gonna lose a little bit of material at the edge, but we wanna lose as little as possible, okay? Now, you'll find that there's areas where, like right here, there's a little bit of grain still attached. If you can pull those off, great, they'll work soft. If not, that'll just get cut off. So if there's a little grain attached, it's not going to soften as well. And if there's big chunks of membrane on the back, it's not going to soften as well. So while I'm going through, I am looking for, like that's a little bit of grain that I just pulled off, looking for those. So we're doing all of the cleanup here as well. Your fingers are going to be slippery and soft at this point. It can be kind of hard to hold on and pull those little tabs but you'll get them. And what you can't get this time, you can get next time, because there will be a next time. We're not done yet, okay? Um, here, when you get out into the leg skins and the corners of the neck and things like that, you will start to make some decisions and say, this is not, this section is not worth fighting for, okay? So, in this leg skin, I can get most of it, but right around this edge, there's a whole bunch of piled up grain and membrane right there. That was just, obviously that was fighting me when I was trying to prepare the skin and it's still fighting me now. So that little half inch, that will just get trimmed around. Okay, so I'll move past that and keep going. Um, don't fight it. If a section of the hide is fighting you, Either it's not the right moisture content and needs more soaking, or there's something actually wrong with it. If it's towards the middle, if it's a section of the hide you want to use and there's something actually wrong with it, try to fix it, right? Try to pull that little tab of, of membrane off or um, grain off or whatever. If it's right here at the edge and you know it's going to be in the section that's going to get trimmed at the end of the day anyway, just move on. It's not worth the fight, right? There's enough work in one of these. 
don't fight for a section that's going to fight you. Now here's a large section that I missed, so I'm going to work that over the stake well before I move on. Okay. And we're just going to keep going around like this for as long as it takes. This is the biggest hard work portion. Okay. I will have at least two more iterations of stretching over the stake, soaking, see what soaked up and is all the way soft and see what needs more stretching over the stake. Okay. It's going to be at least two more iterations. Um, this will probably be the last iteration where I'm working large areas, but I'll find spots from these large areas that didn't fully absorb and need another soak. As you're going through, you'll have a final pass where you find maybe four or five areas that you need to work on the stake, but not much more than that. If you worked anything on the stake, it needs another soak. Okay? Because those little spots that I just worked there, they're stretched out enough to absorb, but you can see they're still... Is this a frame, beloved? Okay. You can see they're still a different color than the rest of the hide. This is all fully finished. It has that fully finished soft texture. This is not. It needs more soak. So if you work anything over the stake, you need another soak. When you pull it out of the soak and you think, oh, nothing else needs staked. Great. That's when you're done. Okay, when there's no further change. No more gain can be made. Everything is consistent texture then we can move on to the next stage. Okay. Now the area that's going to be the most recalcitrant of them all is going to be this right here, right near the neck. So while this is still damp, I'm going to stop doing what I was doing there. Get as much as I can here. Because this is where you have the uh, thickest leather so if you want to do moccasin soles or anything like that this is what you really want to get the most of now I work this really thick section a little bit different mostly you see the flat and I'm working across the flat to get a large area with one stroke to save time when I'm working in this thick section I'm gonna work right on these corners okay so I'm going to put it in that corner and then just pull it across that corner in very little passes, very short, narrow passes. I will also do this on the edges. So if you see my stick, I have a fairly sharp corner. None of it's a real sharp 90 degree, right? You don't want to cut into it or tear holes, right? So here I have a sharper corner, here I have a duller corner, and there I have a flat. And depending on what section of the hide I'm working on, I will use all of those facets to my advantage. The thicker it is and the harder it is to get stretched out, the more I'm really going to work it over that sharp corner. The thinner areas that don't take nearly as much um, persuasion to get stretched out and absorb your material. The more I will use the flat so that I can work quickly. Okay. And you can see now we have this color grading in again. This is finished. Right here's finished. Here's stretched and ready to absorb. And out here at the tips is still too tough to even be stretchable, workable at all. Okay, so that's why there will be another pass. There will be more tough tissue on this neck to work, work over. Okay, so the other patch that's going to be tougher than anything else are the butt pads. So right on top of the back hips, that's, you know, the, the neck is where they blow into each other when they're fighting. So that thickens up a lot. And then the hips are where they scrape over the, the most branches, mm. right? And that's also where if a predator was going to jump up and grab them, 
that's where the predator would jump up and grab. So that's why those that's those areas are where you have the toughest, thickest leather. So it's not consistent all the way across the hide. Okay, so be ready for that when you're working. Um, and you'll see it, you'll feel it when you're actually working your hide. There's only so much that you can grasp through video when something is such a profoundly tactile process. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've worked about a, as much of this neck as it's going to let me work at this stage of moisture absorption. Okay. Just kind of going over it a little bit across the top there. But yeah, I mean, you can you can see already there's there's a change. Mm -hmm. In, in the color pattern here. So this, this is all ready to absorb the fat liquor across the majority of its surface, but I can tell there's gonna be a couple of tough spots to get in the next pass, which means there will be at least a minimum of two more soakings, okay? So I'm gonna keep working this and working and soaking and working and soaking um, it's right about noon now, so I've been going half a day already. This is not a short process. It takes, a, it takes time and patience to do one of these. And I will turn the camera back on when it's time to proceed to the next stage of finishing up this hive. So after about a half dozen cycles or so of working over the uh, stake and re-soaking, you can see just how dramatic a transition we've had, right? No longer is this a rough, hard drum head. This is wet fabric, basically, right? In, in consistency. Now, the next thing we wanna do is squeeze out as much of this liquid as we possibly can. And we're gonna start the drying process. You might see there's a little bit of an oily film that's starting to form and coat and kind of get all over me a little bit too. Um, that's just kind of a sign that the, the hide is saying, I've taken up all of that stuff I possibly can and it's refusing any more of the dressing. Okay. So that's just another good sign that see it there pretty well. Mm -hmm. That's just another good sign that things are progressing as they should. You don't need to worry about that. It's just going to, by the time we're done working this, it will all have either sloughed off or absorbed as the water leaves. Some of those oils will absorb in as a last step. So you can see if I just hold it up here, we don't have any more of those harsh hard spots. The net took a couple extra workings beyond when the rest of the body section was done. That's typical, okay? And now we just need to start drying it. Now you don't wanna dry it too fast. The middle where it's thicker across the back is gonna dry a lot slower than the uh, belly sections. So we want it to dry a little bit evenly. It's a really warm, sunny, breezy day. I'm going to leave it just here on the back of this here chair in the shade and I will check it regularly and when the uh, um, when the belly sections start to be ready to work because there's a lot more stretching and working involved in finishing this I'll turn the camera back on and show you how we do that So this has been out drying for a couple of hours. Um, I had to walk away from it for a little while. So I rolled it up nice and tight and left it like that. And that, if you have to walk away from one of these is the way to do it because the moisture will kind of equilibrate and it won't get over dry in the thin spots. Now, most of the surface moisture is gone there's still a little bit of an oily feel to it, right? As I'm working this, I can definitely feel that my hands are, are uh, getting oiled up a bit because there's quite a lot of oil in this, right? We used a whole cup of oil till all was said and done. Um, and now we're looking at the process 
of stretching it and keeping it stretched as it dries. Up to this point, we have been stretching those fibers, opening up that uh, protein felt so that the dressing and those oils and soap mixture could penetrate into those fibers and allow them to separate. Okay? And the water pressure was helping to get in and help them to separate. So now it's all expanded and fluffed up and we want to get it dry and still fluffed up. Right? If you take this and just let it dry in a ball. It won't go back to hard as a drum head rawhide because it does have those oils in it now. But it won't be a nice material to make a piece of clothing out of either, right? You will have a, you know, a, a, a stiff, scratchy, crunchy, crinkly thing that you would not really want to use as a nice leather good, okay? So this is the long process that once you start, you can't stop. And that is stretching it out. So as it dries, you just gotta keep working it. And you have to work all parts of it. You have to work it in all directions and just keep stretching, keep working, keep stretching, keep working, keep stretching, keep working, okay? Now, the edges are gonna dry first and they're going to want to get crunchy. So as you're working this, you'll still need your stake and you'll still need to get in here and just very carefully work around these edges, okay? And do that fairly consistently. Keep doing it, okay? Keep going around with that. And this is a big part of why you want something with a fairly narrow and fairly sharp point like this. Because you can get it in right at the edge and you can pop that open as it tries to dry shut. Now, you're going to have a little bit of crispy edge, right? Don't worry about that. If it's only you know an, an eighth inch of crispy edge all the way around, we're going to come through with a pair of scissors and trim all of that off before all is said and done. You can't completely prevent getting that crispy edge because the, remember, this is not a true tan. We are dressing the leather. We are not truly tanning the leather, okay? Now, what to watch out for are firstly, one section drying out more than another, okay? If that happens, all is not lost. You haven't lost all of your work, but you do need to re-wet that section. Okay. So, you know, my bucket of what's left of my bucket of goo is still down here. If this were to dry out, I could dip it, squeeze it out, and let it go back to drying again. And then have another chance to open up those fibers and to stretch it out nicely. Okay. So, all is not lost. Second thing to watch out for. Whenever you have this draped over something drying, you're going to have patches in the middle that have a tendency to get a little bit of a crusty surface to them because the surface is drying a lot faster than the interior. This is where you can go at it with the stick or for this I think a wider surface can be really nice so I just have this piece of like one by six or half inch by six and just work those big sections back and forth across it and that'll help break up those crusts Okay. So we can work with more than one tool. And that will help with that problem. The third problem that you can run into is a section that no matter what you do, it won't soften. Okay. If that happens, it means that while we were soaking this, you didn't get the solution to penetrate all the way into the middle. Okay. If that happens, what you need to do is redress the hide, dress it a second time. Here it got a little bit too crunchy too fast on this edge. I'm going to go back to this. I'm going to work it over the sharper point. Okay. So if, if you have us find a section, this no matter what you do, no matter how often and how hard you work it, it will not get soft, stay soft. 
then you need to redress that section. The good news is it's not going to take you nearly as long as it took when you were dressing the entire height at once. Because now you have one trouble spot and you can work that one trouble spot and work the solution, you know, your, your soap and oil solution into that one trouble spot very effectively and you're not going to lose all of the stretch that you developed in the rest of your hide. Okay? So everything here is reversible and repeatable. You don't need to fret if you have a section that's being, um, being a problem. So never fear on that. Now, these edges are really starting to get fairly dry. This is why I'm working them fairly quickly here trying not to talk so much that I lose track of my project, but you could pro you should be able to see it. Let me drape this over this way. Right. You can kind of see that color change starting to come in where it's where it's a lot whiter here and a lot more damp looking, moist looking up here, right? If I squeeze this, it's going to hold together. You can see that there's still that moisture, whereas you know, if I squeeze this, it's just going to kind of fall apart, right? What we're ultimately going for is one that looks like this, all the way across. Okay? It's nice and fluffy, it's kept its loft, has a couple holes in it. Some of those relate to the harvesting of the deer, but I'll fess up, this one was me. <laughs> this one was uh, me and the fleshing knife, I ripped a hole in it there, I feel bad about that. There's still a lot of good usable hide in this. but. If I give this a pull, you can see it's elastic. It springs right back. Okay? When it does this, you're done. Okay? When it feels dry, feels warm and cuddly, and has this bounce to it. Okay? That's how you know you're finished. This one, if I come in the middle and give it a stretch, it holds that. Okay? Because it doesn't have any life to it, right? It just stretches out and holds it. That's very clearly damp. Here on this edge where I was just working, when I stretch it one direction and then stretch it the other, you can see it doesn't bounce back. It still holds that shape. Okay, It's starting to look dry, but it's still slightly cool to the touch, and it's still holding that shape. Okay, Also, if you listen to it, it's not going to pick up on the camera. But when you're working your own hide, and when you do this, you like you stretch it one way and then put up to your ear, stretch it the other, you'll hear sort of a, a I'm not sure what, what adjective to use. Crunchy is the long word. Squeaky. Squeaky is the word, right? Squeaky. right? Almost like squeaky snow when it's 20 below zero, right? sort of a, a, a squeaky sound to it there, okay? When it's dry and all the way fluffed up, there's no squeaky sound, okay? It's not like veg tan leather that always has that squeaky sound to it, right? This is just like stretching cloth back and forth. So that's how you know you're done. Now the process at this point is once you get to this stage where some of it is starting to dry and be real dry you just have to keep fiddling with it and this is going to be two or three hours of fiddling with it right keep working it over the stake as needed right whenever you see a spot that's, that's getting a little crunchy or hard you want to work it here over the stake. Um, like this section right there. This is as dry as the other section. Just work it over the stake here for a minute. You'll see the change. Okay. Looks a lot better there, yes? Right? So now those those uh, fibers are, are 
pulled apart again and can resume drying. The more you work it, the faster it'll dry, right? Because now there's still water diffusing into this region because it's very, very absorptive, but there's not a lot of water here. So this will kind of like act as a little bit of a diffuser. So the more you work it, the more of that effect you have. Also the friction heats it up a little bit, helps it to dry out faster. Okay. And just keep going along. Edges first, then inside from the edges, then the middle. Now once you get to this to the, the squeaky stage, right, where it's definitely starting to definite sorry, definitely starting to look dry, but thankfully I'm done with that. But <laughs> Definitely starting to look dry, but still kind of at that squeaky stage. And that's across the whole hide. You can just kind of sit here and do this with it. Just keep pulling it. Right? You can sit with it in your lap. Watch the TV. It's not going to make a mess. It's not going to stain anything right at that stage. And just kind of keep pulling it one way. Flip it 90 degrees. Keep pulling it the other way. Just work it back and forth and back and forth. This is also a point at which there's some artistry involved in the finishing of your product. You can finish brain tan, brain tan, such that it's relatively stiff or s the softest leather you've ever felt. Okay? What makes the difference is what sort of tools you're using. If you're just doing this in your hands, it will be a nice soft garment quality leather, but it's going to have a fairly smooth solid surface. Okay? If on the other hand you use a breaking stake, like I was there, with a metal edge, not a sharp metal edge, but you know, a metal edge nonetheless, you don't want to cut it with a sharp knife, obviously but a dull metal edge, or with a dulled, deliberately dulled, again, we don't want to cut it, abrasive stone tool, like a stone scraper. What you will do is you will fuzz out the surface, abrade the surface, and it will get more and more suede-like. Hmm. Okay? So, this is where, you know, with a lot of tanning processes, it's all in the chemistry. And once you've chosen your chemistry, you've pretty much chosen your finished product, okay? Fat liquor dressing is not like that. There's really not a lot of chemistry going on. We're not changing the nature of the leather. We are changing the physical structure of the leather. That's why this is not true tanning, right? This is dressing, this is not true tanning. The true tanning will take place when we smoke it later on. That'll be another video, though. Okay? That's actually tanning. That changes the chemistry. This doesn't. We're changing the physical structure. Because all we're doing is changing the physical structure, you have options in how you go about changing that physical structure. Okay? So if you want a smoother surface, more durable leather, focus on doing this in hand and with wooden tools. If you want a super, super soft, um, suede flannel-y leather, then use harsher tools to do more to fuzz that surface. Okay? There's other folks on YouTube you can watch that do harsher methods than what I'm demonstrating now. Um, Buckskin Revolution is the name of a channel. Weona Tebow is the owner of that channel. Go watch her video. She has a whole bunch, and she uses a cable and pulls it back and forth across a metal cable to soften them and raise that, that suede. Okay? I'm trying to do this here deliberately with the simplest, easiest to source, lowest barrier to entry tools and materials that I can come up with. Okay? But there are other ways to do it, 
and there is a lot of artistry in how you choose to execute those techniques and your choice of tools. Your choice of tools will change the physical structure that you come up with at the end of this fat liquor dressing process. Okay. So, since I know that none of you are interested in watching me just do what I'm doing here for the next three hours, <laughs> I'm going to cut this clip off here and we'll join back when I have a finished product to show you. So here you go. This is the piece all stretched out. Now, last night I was stretching and pulling and rubbing over top of the stretching stake and all of that until about 11.30 and I just said, to heck with this, I'm tired. So I took it and rolled it all up nice, stuck it in a Ziploc bag and came back the next morning. And that is totally a fair move. If it's drying too slow and you um, just don't get it done in time, you could just stick it in a bag like that and move on. That's also one of the advantages of using the soap and oil solution over either the egg or the brain is that you never have to worry about it souring on you, right? That stuff will keep at room temperature for weeks. It's soap for crying out loud. It keeps, okay? So you can completely put all considerations of that sort of thing out of your mind. Now, wet leather will mold given enough time, but that takes substantially more than from 11.30 at night until I wake up and have my breakfast and cup of coffee, okay? At which point I resume stretching and scraping over the steak and all of that business, okay? So, um... There's no process that I did off camera that I didn't show you on camera. And boy, this is just nice and light and, you know, real nice and fluffy and loose. Um, came out very nicely. Like I said, when it was still wet, you could run your hands over it and feel a little bit of an oily film. But as it dries, that just slurps up into the protein fibers. So it is no oily feel whatsoever very absorbent, very light, okay? Now, the last thing I do need to do is to trim off the crunchy edges. And you always get crunchy edges, okay? It's just the nature of the thing. It will, even with all of those oils that we've soaked into it, it will still dry back to a rawhide-like product if you aren't stretching it as you 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 work, okay? And it's basically impossible to get all the way out to the edge. But, other than the edge itself, we, we're, we're good. We're good all the way through. So the last step is to take a regular old boring pair of scissors and we are just going to go along and just trim the edge back to material that is soft enough that you can put stitches through it. Okay? So we're not losing much. We're just going to cut around any hard spots. The other reason that you'll get some hard spots right at the edge is the fact that it's sometimes hard to get the last little bit of grain and membrane off of the edge. Often a little bit will want to lip over and curl. And that, the presence of that then impedes your ability to soften. So don't judge yourself, beat yourself up, or be so obsessive over that that you spend so much time on it that you don't get the rest of your project done. Okay. As you can see, I'm trimming around here and it's just a very small little ribbon that I'm trimming off and it takes very little time to do. Okay. 
Um, as I get around, there's one more little spot that I want to show you here. Okay. Here. You see that? That's um, some of the grain surface. Having that grain on really impedes the process of getting the whole thing soaked up with your solution. Right. So because of this hole in the hide, I wasn't able to really scrape that down for fear of ripping a whole strip off. When I was first working some of these hides, I was trying to just fight with every last little bit of grain all, all the way around these holes. And I ended up ripping huge sections, especially around the belly. So I'd have a hide this size end up with just like a little square. So I've got, you know, I kept those little squares. We will get something out of them, but I only got half my hide. But you see, it's much better to say, okay, I'll be cutting that off at the end of the process. And I lose this little ribbon, right? I lose that little ribbon, right? So what? Was this little piece going to be the key determining factor as to whether you could get a project done or not with this sheet of leather? Gosh, no, of course not, right? Cut it off, do what you can do, save the most that you can save, and then be done with the trouble spots, okay? Don't fight it. If at any point in this you find yourself fighting it, you're doing something wrong, reevaluate okay same thing here this foot I just could not get through that little bit of grain okay so this did not soften up now if I was gonna alum soak this that would come soft just fine right but when you're not doing a harsh pickle or a tying step that little bit of grain on there makes it really hard to soften that place mm -hmm. okay there is a tradition of doing hair on buckskin in which of course you would leave that but I need to do some more study on that. I'm not entirely sure what's allowing them to get through to you know to get softened through that grain layer. Okay? Um, yeah, again here, you see I have this little rip, and then I just stop fighting it here. And likewise, in this trimming step, I'm just going to stop fighting it right there. Okay, so we'll keep trimming around. Now we're coming around the neck. This is going to be thicker. You won't get the same softness and stretch out of that neck hide that you will the rest of it. But you can do things with this neck hide that you can't do with the rest of it. If you want to do moccasins or, you know, gaiters to go over your boot, bottom of pant legs. This is prime territory on the hide, this neck skin. But for, like, next to the skin clothing... You would not want to cut a, cut out a pattern so that this thick neck skin was like bunching up under your armpit or something, you know? So when you're working with this sort of hide, you have to be aware that it is a non-homogenous material. Here you can see it, it got soft pretty much all the way right out to just all but the very edge. Down here, it's super soft around that belly skin. Right, if you're cutting out a pattern where the bunching fabric or anything like that is going to be annoying or cloying, this belly skin is what you want to use. Right, for shoulders or sleeves or anything like that. This is real good territory for that. It's part of why it takes so many hides to do this sort, you know, to do real traditional work. Because you're using different parts of the hide for very different projects. Okay. 
I'm just gonna stop there. That's oh, about half of it done. You can see where I'm going with this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now this one behind me that I showed earlier is all the way trimmed. You can see those nice edges are all the way trimmed around. And when you do these, you want to try to get a couple that match up. Because remember, these are dressed, they are not tanned. To tan them, if I could get them lined up correctly, not put the bed sheets on in the crossways and get frustrated three times. Uh, to tan them, what we will do is we will match up the corners sew them together in a bag and this one is larger than the one underneath it so it doesn't quite match and then that bag will go over a smoldering fire and we will allow the smoke to penetrate until it is colored the entire hide that is the actual tanning step and that is where we have a chemical change that will do some cross-linking with these protein fibers okay currently this is nice and soft and supple and there's a lot you could do with it as is but if it gets wet, you have to redo the whole drying and stretching step. Okay? It's not yet washable. After it's smoked, then it's actually tanned. And then it becomes washable. And that's one of the things that's unique about this. The dressing agent is soap. A little bit of soap and water will do nothing but good for it. But you need that smoking step to allow you to do the washing and not have to do all the arduous work of stretching it for a whole day. Okay? That's the key thing that allows that to happen. And um, once you have done all of that, you have a truly unique gar garment leather that's soft enough for next to the skin use and won't degrade with you know human sweat and oils and all of those things that will the acidity of human sweat that will break down leather goods over time because you can wash it so you can use it in ways that you can't use any other leather product we are going to um, do another several hides start matching them up by size and show you the smoking step but that's going to be another video. So I hope that you will, of course, subscribe to the channel if you've enjoyed this so that you can stay tuned for that video when it comes up here and uh, uh, when we have time to do it. And until then, have a wonderful, blessed day, and I'll see you next time at Old Ways Rising.